It is November 1940. The Second World War in the European theatre is in full swing. Under the moonlit sky, Lieutenant Giovanni Barbini commanded the aging torpedo boat Fabrizi amidst the calm waters of the Adriatic. As the convoy, flanked by an auxiliary cruiser, sailed lazily towards Brindisi, Barbini's senses remained sharp, attuned to any sign of danger. Suddenly, a distant silhouette caught his eye, approaching British vessels. Immediately, Barbini directed Fabrizi towards the oncoming threat, his crew ready for battle. As the British guns roared to life, Barbini's heart raced. Judging by the silhouettes, he was heavily outnumbered. After the Battle of Cape Passero, resulting in a decisive defeat for the Italians, the maritime situation in the Mediterranean remained tense. Italy's naval dominance was challenged by British naval superiority. This pressure intensified following the British success in disrupting Italian supply lines and conducting minor air raids on Italian ports. In response, Italian naval strategy focused on protecting vital supply routes and bolstering defences, particularly around key naval bases, such as Taranto. Supermarina's subsequent attempts to engage the British fleet were hindered by enemy reconnaissance, preventing favourable confrontations. The Italians faced challenges in maintaining fuel supplies in distant theatres, but continued offensive actions when opportunities arose. One week after the disaster at Cape Pizarro, Four Italian destroyers attacked a convoy in the Red Sea, leading to a prolonged engagement with British vessels. Then, in mid-October, Mussolini decided to invade Greece. The Italian Navy opposed the campaign, but once it was launched, they did their utmost best to supply Italian troops invading Greece. This led to enormous backlogs in Albanian ports and a serious reallocation of resources. Meanwhile, the British sought to reinforce Greece through the Mediterranean, necessitating the risky convoy route. Italy's array of six battleships posed a great threat to Royal Navy operations in the region, prompting justified concern within the British Admiralty. Engaging the concentrated Italian fleet was risky, so a different plan had to be come up with. The British Royal Navy, under Admiral Andrew B. Cunningham, began planning a daring aerial assault on the Italian fleet anchored at Taranto aiming to cripple its naval power and shift the balance of naval dominance in the Mediterranean. This would become known as the famous Taranto Night, where two dozen swordfish biplanes crippled four of Italy's six major battleships. In total, during the raid on Taranto, ten diverse movements across the Mediterranean were launched as a means of diversionary action. This included supplying Malta from both Gibraltar and Alexandria and raiding known Italian shipping lanes. The goal was to confuse and overwhelm Italian reconnaissance. Among these convoys launching a diversionary strike was Vice Admiral Henry Pridham Whipple's Force X embarking on a raid against Italian Albanian naval traffic. Under the shimmering moonlight, a seemingly routine voyage unfolded amidst the Adriatic waters as four steamers, their hulls empty, traced their route back to Brindisi from Valona. Accompanied by an aged torpedo boat, Fabrizi commanded by Lieutenant Giovanni Barbini and the auxiliary cruiser Ram 3. The convoy cruised westward at a leisurely eight knots, anticipating nothing beyond the ordinary, a mundane and routine supply voyage, as it were. Meanwhile, Pridham Whipple's Force X pushed forward through the strait, its patrol uneventful. As midnight passed, nothing of note happened so far. With the impression of a failed mission looming, the fleet prepared to regroup. Pridham Whipple maintained a tight formation, with the light cruiser Orion leading the column and Australian light cruiser Sydney guarding the rear. The tribal-class destroyer Nubian patrolled to the west, while Mohawk mirrored its vigilance to the east. At 0115, Mohawk detected a distant silhouette to the southeast, the darkened outline of the convoy, eight miles distant. With swift coordination, the British vessels altered course, aiming for a surprise encounter. Yet their intentions were thwarted, for Italian lookouts had also caught sight of the approaching British. Without delay, Fabrizi turned towards the oncoming threat as the convoy scrambled to react. The silence shattered at 0125 as Mohawk's guns roared to life, targeting Fabrizi from a distance of 4,000 yards. The British cruisers surged forward, 
assaulting the convoy's western flank while illuminating the scene with star shells from their secondary batteries. Orion unleashed a relentless barrage of four-inch shells, focusing its main battery on Capo Vado, the third freighter, positioned some six kilometers away. Despite Barbini's attempts to initiate a torpedo attack, the chaos of battle hindered communications, leaving his orders unheard by his torpedo officer. By 0128, Fabrizi, now under heavy fire, veered starboard, unleashing its own four-inch guns from a distance of four kilometers, all the while cloaking the convoy in a smokescreen in a desperate bid for escape. The British barrage of fire continued unabated nonetheless. Ajax honed in on Ram 3, while Sydney rained shells upon Antonio Locatelli, its starboard ablaze in response. Moments later, Sydney redirected its fury towards Bermuda, while Ajax aimed its guns at one of the lead steamers. With precision, Orion launched a pair of torpedoes towards Capo Vado hitting the vessel. It began to sink. On the opposite flank of the convoy, the Ram 3 altered its course to the northeast, responding to the enemy gun flashes by unleashing 17 rounds in their direction. Along with this defensive maneuver, the captain opted for a withdrawal course to spare the ship from what he deemed to be a futile sacrifice. Meanwhile, the Italian vessel Fabrizi was not about to give up, turning around to position itself between the enemy cruisers and the vulnerable merchant ships. Despite sustaining heavy damage from enemy fire, Fabrizi's guns continued to roar defiantly. A relentless barrage from the British cruiser Orion, comprising 31 six-inch salvos and torpedoes, finally sealed the fate of the Premuda. The adjacent Catalani, ablaze from the shells, met a similar fate. Both ships slowly sank to the depths of the ocean. As the British destroyers formed a menacing column, they methodically targeted each merchantman along the convoy's port beam. Amidst the chaos, Catalani, struck by enemy salvos, lay incapacitated, billowing clouds of steam into the night air. However, just as Mohawk prepared to launch torpedoes, the British Admiral Pridham Whipple ordered a swift course change. He wanted his squadron to rejoin HMS Illustrious, the aircraft carrier which had just completed the raid on Toronto. His departure marked the end of the assault. As Force X departed the scene, the British Admiral presumed the outcome, believing they had sunk one ship and left two burning while observing one fleeing vessel engulfed in flames. However, the reality proved even better. All four ships had been sunk, with Antonio Locatelli going down with all hands. This amounted to nearly 17,000 gross registered tons. In total, the Italians lost 47 sailors with 59 wounded. It was an unmitigated disaster for the Italians. Italian torpedo boats rescued 140 sailors. The auxiliary cruiser returned to Bari as its commander faced a court-martial for perceived desertion. This battle marked the first night surface attack on an Italian convoy. It also stands as the sole instance where Allied surface warships successfully disrupted Italy's vital Balkan supply route, which at the time accounted for a significant portion of the nation's merchant shipping. In response to this threat, the Italian Navy bolstered its convoy escorts. Elsewhere, HMS Illustrious and its swordfish biplanes had an arguably even bigger victory for the British. Pridham Whipple would soon learn of the successful raid on Taranto, a night strike which would decisive alter the course of naval military history. Thank you very much for watching this video. Please leave a like, it really helps out the channel. If there is a topic, battle or person you would like to know more about, let me know your thoughts in a comment. I would also like to thank all my patrons and channel members for their generous support. If you enjoy House of History and you want to support my work, consider joining me on Patreon. For just $1 per month, you will already gain early access to all my videos without any in-video advertisements. Don't forget to subscribe. See you next time.